Thank you, Steve. You make a good salesman. <laughs> and thank you very much to the Genomics Forum for allowing me to be a Bright Ideas Visiting Fellow there. It was a fantastic experience. And thank you to the conference organisers for inviting me to come along and give this keynote speech. Um, you will have gathered from Steve's introduction that I'm not an ethicist or a sociologist, nor do I work on genetics. So this isn't going to be an academic presentation at all. Um, those of us Brits here of a certain age, and I include myself amongst them, may remember that when we were little on the BBC radio home service, as it was called then, there was an afternoon uh, programme where somebody read a story. And she would, there was a very sort of plinky plong, plinky plong tune, which may come back to some of you. And then this person with beautiful received pronunciation would say, are you sitting comfortably? Then let's begin. So that's what we're going to do. And I'm going to tell you some stories. Because I know everyone likes a story, and it's the end of a hard day. And really, you don't want to have to think. You just want to switch off your brains, and that's fine. But I don't want you falling asleep, OK? So not too comfortable. So I'm going to start off, then, with the story of the Irish giant, Charles Byrne. At least I would if it moved on. Why is it not moving on? There. Oh, too far. Sorry. There we are. Charles Byrne. Some of you, I'm sure, will, will know the story of the Irish giant or the giant O'Brien. Uh, he died, as you see, in 1783. There's a contemporary engraving of him on the left, and on the right is Shepherd's engraving of the Hunterian Museum at the Royal College of Surgeons. And you can see Giant O'Brien's skeleton is on the right-hand side at the back. Now, so he's... Charles Byron, the giant Brian, is actually not very far from here. It's just down at Lincoln's Inn Fields, and you can go and see him. He died in 1783, aged 22 years old. He was 7 foot 7 tall, and he was from County Tyrone in Northern Ireland. One of his uh, neighbours, I won't say friends, a man called Jack Vance, uh, suggested him that it would be a good idea if he went out and exhibited himself for money because he was so tall and that he could get very rich if he toured the, the shows and fairgrounds. And in 1782, he came to London and an advertisement was sent out saying, Irish giant, to be seen this and every day this week in his large, elegant room at the cane shop next door to Late Cox's Museum Spring Gardens. And that wasn't very far from here either. The admission was half a crown, which in today's money is about 12p, I think. Um, but by the late autumn of him exhibiting himself and people paying to see him, the, the novelty had very much worn off. The price had dropped and people just weren't coming to see him anymore. And he, of course, turned to drink because it, was it wasn't exactly a very pleasant life for him, was it, as you might imagine. And then, unfortunately, he got robbed outside a tavern of £700. Think of it. That was all his worldly wealth. Why was he carrying it in his pocket? We don't know. Maybe he had nowhere else to keep it. Anyway, he was robbed of all this. And from then on, his life took a really sad downward, not even a spiral, downward rush through alcoholism, ill health, and, of course, total despair. And he knew he was ill. He knew he was dying. But he did not want the surgeon anatomists of the day to get his body. Nevertheless, they all knew he was dying, and they congregated around his house, it is said, like harpoonists around a dying whale. He decided that he would be buried in a lead coffin at sea so that nobody could get him. But John Hunter, one of the famous anatomists of the time, was very, very keen to get Byron's skeleton. And, of course, he got his henchmen to bribe the people who were going to bury the coffin at sea and, of course, acquired Byron's body and uh, later wrote to a friend, I've lately got a tall man. John Hunter himself died in, 18, <coughs> sorry, in 1793. <coughs> Here we are. Here's Joshua Reynolds' portrait of John Hunter and... In the back top right corner, you can actually see the Irish giant's lower legs and his feet, because by then, of course, he was a skeleton and being exhibited. And in July the, on July the 5th, in 1893, the centenary of Hunter's death, there was an exhibition at the Royal College of Surgeons of a collection of Hunterian relics. 
One of these was the copper, in which the Irish giant Charles Byrne, who was exhibited in London as O'Brien, the Irish giant, was boiled. So that was a nice thing, wasn't it, to have exhibited. And it was lent by Professor Cheen of Edinburgh. God rest his soul. Um, so the skeleton then turned up at the Royal College of Surgeons, a Hunterian collection. And it has subsequently, Charles Byrne's life has been written about by the novelist Hilary Mantel uh, in a book called The Giant O'Brien. Uh, he's also been written about by me a little bit in my novel there, The Embalmer's Book of Rescues. And it's interesting, isn't it, how we all home in on this exhibit. There was a recent controversy on the BBC Radio Today programme. I don't, some of you may have heard it. Um, P Professor Len Doyle and some others uh, are starting a movement to have O'Brien's skeleton buried at sea, as he, so, as he had originally wished. And there's, if you look at the British Medical Journal website, there's a very interesting paper there, but also a beautiful little video about this uh, controversy and, and so on. So we all home in on this. Pathologists there, geneticists, writers, ethicists, lawyers. So O'Brien is, uh, or Charles Byrne, is very much um, part of our knowledge now. And um, the gene as for the geneticists... Professor Marta Corbinitz, here's a picture here. She is at, excuse me, Professor of Endocrinology and Metabolism at Barts and the London NHS Trust. She, in fact, had looked at the DNA of two of his teeth because she was particularly interested in the genomics of a particular sort of giantism that occurs in County Tyrone, Northern Ireland. And this is uh, the, an inherited form of pituitary tumour tumor called familial isolated pituitary adenoma, or FIPA, which is caused by a variant in a gene known as AIP, and this tumour causes gigantism and acromegaly in this county Tyrone area. And she, so she was able to look at the DNA of Charles Byron's teeth and find that he actually had this altered AIP gene. And here, standing next to her, is this wonderful man, Brendan Holland, also from that area, who, it turns out, is a distant relative of Charles Byrne and has the same form of inherited um, uh, alteration in the AIP gene. So there's rather a nice story here about how, how a poor man who is exhibited as a freak came to end up in a museum, perhaps as a teaching aid, perhaps just because Hunter rather prized his skeleton, and then became used by writers and by geneticists and now by ethicists. And Brendan Holland, when asked whether he thought that Byron's body should be um, buried at sea, his skeleton should be buried at sea, said no. He felt that, um, that we can't impose today's moral judgments on Hunter, he said. But also he felt that Byron would have approved now of the way in which his skeleton and his DNA and other information is being used. And I hope that is the case, actually. I hope that um, you know, the outcome has been pretty good for Charles Byrne. Moving on a little bit to John Hunter then. As I said, he died in 1793, age 64, having amassed this extraordinary collection. He was a very interesting man himself. Frank Buckland... Wrong one. Frank Buckland, who was a century later, was a, a naturalist, a taxidermist, and all this sort of thing. He was also the son of Bishop Buckland, um, who was supposed to have eaten his way... Sorry, Dean Buckland, was supposed to have eaten his way through the animal kingdom, starting with things like slugs and so on, and uh, frogs, and even somebody's brain, apparently. So uh, but he, he was a geologist and naturalist, too. Anyway, Buckland was very keen, John Hunter had been a great hero of his, and he was very keen to look for him, and he looked around in the coffin, for the coffin in the vaults of St. Martin's in the Field in 1859, and actually found the coffin, and the story in Buckland's biography of how he found it is, is quite interesting anyway. The only reason I'm mentioning Buckland is to sort of segue into my next topic, because Buckland also very much enjoyed the company of giants. Many giants used to come and visit him, a Chinese giant, for example, and the giant Bryce, who was seven foot seven tall and a well-proportioned and amiable man, 
who, who gave Buckland a pair of his shoes and a cast of his hands as mementos. Um, and apparently there was a story recounted in the Buckland biography that a lady dwarf, so now we're shifting from giants, a lady dwarf was one day invited to meet him, um, the giant, but with untoward results, the good-natured giant took her up as a little girl on his knee, causing an explosion of indignation. I am 19, she cried, and to treat me like a baby. It was long before her ruffled dignity could be appeased. So I mention this because I want to move on to another genetic condition, achondroplasia, or disproportionate dwarfism. And you can see here the Queen giving uh, a medal to Ellie Simmons, who is a Paralympic uh, swimmer. Um, there's Velasquez, a uh, famous draw, uh, painting there with a dwarf, an achondroplasic Las Meninas on the right, and an x ray to show what happens in achondroplasia, in that some of the long bones and the bones of the hand uh, are shorter than they should be, and the, the skull is, tends to have a different shape from what it should have. And this, as I said, is genetic. Is due to a, a mutation on chromosome 4. Here's rather, we've been talking about science and art a bit earlier. Here's a, a really rather lovely interpretation of the human chromosomes by artist Andrea Duncan. Um, 23 pairs. We as humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes, of course, and she has arranged pairs of socks to, in the, the right sort of shapes and sizes. And, you know, when you have a, a classic chromosome spread, that's how they look like, how they look. Down number, we've got X chromosomes there. So you can tell, actually, that it is, uh, this, is, this is female chromosomes, obviously. And you can tell this because the socks are neatly arranged. <laughs> So chromosome 4, then, is where the sock went wrong. Somebody did the knitting wrong in achondroplasia. And it's just one little gene, the gene which, uh, which codes for a protein called fibroblast FGFR3. I've gone complete blank. Fibroblast growth factor receptor 3. And in that gene, just one codon changes. So one amino acid changes, so the protein goes wrong, the knitting goes wrong, and the bone growth, as a result, is wrong. And it can be, arise as a spontaneous mutation, but it then is heritable. And I would just like to draw your attention to the Genomic Forum's uh, Human Genre Project, which has all kinds of different stories and poems associated with each of the chromosomes in the human genome. It's worth looking at that with some very interesting takes on what happens to the different chromosomes. Now, in my, here comes the plug, of course, in my latest book, <laughs> in my latest novel, The Embalmer's Book of Recipes, one of the characters, one of the three main characters, is a mathematician called Lisa, and she is also an achondroplasic. And the math she works on is fairly complicated, abstruse, and I had to learn a bit about it myself, which is always a lot of fun when you're a writer, having to actually go away and, and talk to people who know about this subject. And um, anyway, that's almost by the by. But I was, as a re result of this, invited to talk at a couple of rather serious maths conferences. Again, is the light relief like this at the end of the day? Um, but one of them was also called Maths in Fiction Conference in, in Oxford a few years back organised by the London Math Society. And Tony Mann, the organiser, reviewed my novel. And he wrote, the novel is not always comfortable. And, of course, I read this, and once my hair stood on end. You know, we novelists are very nervous creatures. What do you, what's he mean? It's not very really comfortable. Have I, have I written it badly? You know? um, and so I sort of emailed him, what do you mean? <laughs> and he said, um, it was not comfortable reading because it had made him uncomfortable because he had been forced, as he said, to confront his prejudices. Prejudices he hadn't really even thought about until then, about reading some, about somebody with a rather obvious genetic disability. And, but thankfully, despite this, Lisa had become one of his favourite fictional mathematicians, so that was a relief anyway. But I, that, I found that very interesting concept, that he had actually been made uncomfortable, and I began to think more and more about this business of a writer. Um, <coughs> 
when you're a writer, you want to empathise with your characters, you want your readers to empathise with them, but do you want them just to empathise completely so that they feel they're nice and fluffy and comfortable, no, aren't they lovely? Or do you want to actually start thinking about what their real, real lives are like, in, in so far as a fictional character can have a real life? When I was researching the novel, um, I worked for before I started writing it, actually, I'd worked for a couple of years with Tom Shakespeare, who some of you may know, who was at that time um, at the Policy, Ethics and Life Science Centre at Newcastle. Uh, we had a two-year project called Talking Science in Cumbria. Cumbria is where I live. And during the course of that, I went out and spoke to all kinds of groups, farmers' discussion groups, WIs, uh, Sir Optimists, Humanists, about modern science, about the Human Genome Project, which was very much the fore then, about um, genetic selection and modification, about stem cells, cloning, things like that. And it was a fantastic time. I really, really enjoyed it. But I mention this because Tom, if you know him, he is an achondroplasic, and he writes about disability, and he works now with the World World Health Organization. And because Tom used to come to visit us, I became, I suppose, intrigued, that's maybe the wrong word, about what it was like to be achondroplasic. And eventually I said to Tom, would would you mind if I had an achondroplasic in my novel? You know, because I felt that was kind of bad in a way, not asking him. And he was perfectly fine about it, being Tom, and introduced me to two fantastic female achondroplasics, Jo and Margaret, who I spent a lot of time with, actually, and uh, going to their houses, and they came to me, and, you know, just generally hanging out and chatting about all kinds of things, and what fun they were, what a lot of humour and uh, good nature and preparedness to talk about being achondroplasic. And... um, So we can read about the mutability of the genes. We can read about the heritability of achondroplasia. And we can read about the developmental genetics of achondroplasia, how how this develops in the embryo, in the fetus. But then, you know, what about the life if you're an achondroplasia? And at the risk of seeming simplistic, I'll just sort of throw out this idea. Could this be another way of defining genomics? I know we all struggle a little now and again with defining genomics, but... Define it as a consideration of the way in which someone's genetic makeup defines that person's way of living. Might that be another way of looking at it? Might perhaps some of you already think of it in those terms. But um, so, how the genetic makeup defines a lifestyle, a lifetime, a way of living. Christine Heiskeller this morning in her, her talk uh, said something about various aspects of yourself are written in your genes and you can get stuck in these identities and uh, that was another thing I think I wanted to explore a bit in this novel because Jo especially tended to look at her disability in a social rather than uh, a medical medical terms I mean acons do have medical problems it's undeniable they have great problems with their spines and so on but she looked at it much more in in terms of a social disability um In other words, the way in which she could or couldn't live in a world that was made for people of average stature, of our height. Um, If you look about you, almost everything you do is designed for people of average stature, isn't it? So if if you're small, you have to come to terms with ways of dealing that, even driving a car. And she said something very interesting to me about um, the question of seeing eye to eye. There'd been a suggestion that the office she was working in, they might employ another achondroplasic. And she'd been very much against this because she suddenly realised that she would, every day then, see someone else who was achondroplasic and see someone eye to eye. Whereas in her normal daily life, she didn't think about being achondroplasic. So So seeing eye to eye has all kinds of interesting connotations when you're a person of small stature like that. And uh, how how you do that and what it means. Is it metaphorical or is it purely physical and so on? And we talked a lot about this. And I think that probably helped me to understand genomics a little more too, talking back to Joe about this uh, in the way she lived. And so it became important to me in, in writing this novel that uh, the character Lisa doesn't see herself as having a disability. She's her own person. She 
as a mathematician. She's lecturing to students. She has a high-profile research program. She's coming to national, international conferences, and so on. And she is just getting on with her life, despite the constraints in, imposed on her. But I, I've gone into that in a little bit of detail, because... Just, that was something I should have shown up early. Um, in writing about difference, we're writing, I suppose, about each side of the average. I think the thing that most was brought home to me in thinking and talk, think about Econdoplasia, talking to these people, was um, I became very shockingly aware of the importance of trust. People were telling me things that were very germane, very personal to their lives, and I might be going to use these in some form in a fictional context. And so this question of trust then becomes very important, I think, as a writer. What are you going to use? What are you not going to use? Are you, are you, by using some rather intimate things, going to reveal um, characteristics, perhaps, of the people you've talked to? And so it becomes a very delicate and very interesting problem, I think, and, and I'm sure it's something that you possibly think about, those of you who interact with people with disabilities and so on. Someone of procreative age is, of course, with a heritable genetic-based disability or disease, is likely to think about what it means to have offspring. Are they going to do it? Are they going to choose or not? And this was a question that came up this morning, whether or not to choose, and some people prefer not to choose. And with genetic diagnosis, of course, in pre-implantation or fetal diagnosis, then there is always the, the question that you can actually choose whether or not to, to terminate a life or, or not to have uh, a fertilized egg implanted. And this, of course, can become a very uncomfortable topic. Here's something else that's uncomfortable. So let's then think about the genomics of a population. Let's think about wiping out a gene or genes. Let's think about genocide. Are you feeling uncomfortable? Okay, let's think about sheep. Make you more comfortable. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. And discussing genes, that we're talking about difference, ethics, and so on. And I should, before I move on, on my own website, anlingard.com, um, there's this quite a large section relating to the novel, lots of images and information. But there are three wonderful short videos that Tom Shakespeare and John Burns, who's professor of genetics at Newcastle, have made about echondroplasia. They're very funny, they're very thought-provoking, and they're well worth watching. They're short, too, so... And the first one, a head-to-head -head between John and Tom, starts off with John leaning forward and saying, you should have been terminated. <laughs> so that's, it's, a good, it's a good video, well worth looking at. Anyway, sorry, getting back to sheep. Um, I was pleased to see a picture of sheep earlier today, too. That was very nice. Um, on the left are herdwicks, which is what I keep in my small holding. These are young ones. They're fell sheep. Aren't they gorgeous? Um, it's very interesting genetically, actually, though I shouldn't get onto this. But they're born completely black, and within six or eight months, their legs and faces go white. Nice genes switch on off there. And over the next year, their fleeces go blue-gray. So quite an interesting colour morphing there through some genetic control. Anyway, um, we're talking about genocide relating to sheep. There is something called the National Scrapie Eradication Programme. And sheep have particular, uh, in a particular gene, they express different codons which affect their susceptibility to scrapie. Now, scrapie is a bit like bovine spongiform encephalopathy. It's a bit like creutzfeldt jakob disease. It's a, it's a spongy brain disease, essentially, and it's very horrible for the sheep. Um, now, so they express codons which make them susceptible not disease, or make them resistant to the disease, right? So the National Scrapie Plan is essentially to cull out all those sheep which have the codons for susceptibility. And when I used to talk about this in the Talking Science in Cumbria um, talks, the f farmers are fantastic practical geneticists, actually. They know a huge amount about genetics. And... Uh, there was considerable concern about this programme, which is still going on, incidentally, 
because essentially what you're removing is a proportion of the population in which there's been a stable genetic polymorphism for hundreds if not thousands of years <laughs> in the case of some of these old attempts, or old um, breeds of sheep. And so, you know, what you're doing essentially is possibly creating a genetic bottleneck in which the, the um, scrapie resistant sheep might actually be susceptible to some other disease not yet hitting them, like um, whatever it's called, this Schaffen, Schaffen something virus that's coming through at the moment. I can't remember its name. Anyway. Um, and farmers have this wonderful genotype calculator grid which uh, DEFRA has produced for them. And they know how to read it with, with all the ARR, ARR crosses and the VHQs and so on. And you can figure out what proportion of your lambs are going to be susceptible and which you should cull and so on. And the farmers that have the good rams that are the, the double resistant, double ARR, ARR, of course, get a very good price for those rams. Okay. So, so genocide in the sheep population, then, if you like. Um, there was also, of course, foot and mouth disease in 2001, which was absolutely horrific for those of us living in Cumbria. That's an aerial view of the burial chambers 10 years on, which is now um, a nature reserve. And that's not genomics. Foot and mouth disease and this massive genocide wiping out of sheep breeds in an enormous scale. Um, this was geographical, not uh, genomic. It was to do with supposed dangerous contacts. They were living in the wrong place, it was thought. And so half a million animals were, were killed. And, of course, there was a massive reduction in the gene pool as a result. And some of the rarer breeds, like the Herdericks, there was a big um, pu push to save their genes. In fact, ram sperm was collected and, and stored in case they were more or less wiped out. Because if you so reduce your, the genomics in the population, you know, it's not going to bounce back and be a strong population. I mean, that goes without saying. So... Sorry to diverge into sheep, but it's much less uncomfortable, isn't it, than talking about um, culling out human genes. Um, but in the novel, I wanted to write about this diagnosis and eradication of genes in some way. And so sheep provided, I suppose, quite a useful metaphor in some ways. And why should you care about sheep? I, I know some of you don't. <laughs> <laughs> it's strange to me, but uh, there we are. Uh, why should you care? Uh, I gave a, a talk, incidentally, at the Royal Institution's Fiction Lab a few years back, and somebody said to me, um, well, wh why do the farmers care about killing the sheep? They kill them anyway. You know, they send them off to the abattoir. And I, I must admit, I, I was just so taken... I'm still taken aback by that comment <laughs> because, you know, these aren't, aren't just a, a crop. <laughs> These animals, are, a lot of them are very pedigree animals and have been in families for generations and gradually being, a, you know, they're friends. <laughs> um, anyway, that's by the way. But the, the sheep and what happened to them was actually horribly relevant to the lives of the humans that looked after them and the humans that had to kill them and the human vets and so on and had a profound effect, psychological effect, which is still inherent in, in many people, actually. Truth, in this case, I think was worse than fiction, to be honest. So we talked about culling sheep. We could talk about uh, selective breeding of mice. We could talk about cloning in frogs. Um, again, Christine talked earlier about species boundaries. Um, so where do you start to feel uncomfortable in, when we're talking about all these different species and killing them off and... and uh, uh, G genetic selection and so on. So I, I thought I would just throw out that idea. Where do, what makes you uncomfortable? Where's your cut-off point? Is it just at fruit flies and you're unhappy about everything above that or, or do you just not care about sheep but you care about dogs? You know, so where do you, where's your cut-off point and why? Which is just quite an interesting thought. Just another little thing to throw out. Moving on then um, to... some research at the Genomics Forum that came out of the work I was doing, the, the background research I did for the Embalmer's Book of Recipes. During that background research, I had a, a grant from the Wellcome Trust 
for which I was extremely grateful, which allowed me to visit a lot of the big anatomy collections in places like Leiden and Amsterdam, uh, here in London, of course, uh, Glasgow, and the other Hunterian Museum, William Hunter's Museum in, in Glasgow, and go to a lot of the libraries and you know read a lot of really old books and documents. It's very exciting. And in the course of going round some of these museums, I began to be, I suppose increasingly disturbed, fascinated, but increasingly disturbed about why some of these exhibits were there. And the Museum Vrolik in Amsterdam, which some of you may know, has a huge collection, collection of teratogenic fetuses. And it's a very surreal place. It's very modern. Glass shelves, chrome lights, spotlit, glass jars. And when I went there, it was even more surreal. I was looking at these truly horrifying uh, things, genetic mutations and developmental mutations to fetuses in this sort of glossy area. And outside there, were, there was a conference in the corridor and people were having their cups of coffee and chatting. There were some workmen banging at the central heating ducts. And it was, it was all rather a surreal experience. Um, the, the bottom right picture there is the Surgeons Hall Museum in Edinburgh, which is where I was able to work when I had the Bright Ideas Fellowship at the Genomics Forum. And the Surgeons Hall Museum has a huge and old anatomy and pathology collection <coughs> for teaching purposes. And Steve Sturdy has written a very nice paper called Making Sense of the Pathology Museum, which I've enormously enjoyed reading. The, most of the exhibits and specimens um, in the museum were, were derived from people who had no opportunity for consent. I mean, consent wasn't even an issue in their time. And Andrew Connell, who's the collections manager at the museum, rather touchingly refers to them as patients, um, which I rather like, actually. It, patients, not donors, because they weren't really donors. And I began to think, well, what caused them? Not, not just why are they there, but what caused them to be there? Their skeletons, the bits of them, and so on. And what are the human stories of the patients? So that's what my next bit of research led on to. And in the course of my time at the forum, I, I, was, I chose various specimens at the museum and researched as much as I could of what was known about them as individuals, which is very little, of course, in many cases, and tried to piece together where they lived and what they might have been doing, and eventually wrote some fictional or part fictional stories about some of them, and also some non fictional pieces as well which are all um, on the forum's creative space. And, and my thanks to Chris Berry of the forum for, for this very nice little flyer, which gives you a lead into where the stories are <coughs> on the forum's creative space. And I will just tell you one story about someone I've called Andrew Kerr. He was born in 1898, and he died in 1948, so rather recently. And that's why I've given him a fictional name. When he was born, he had a, a third leg growing out of the back of him. Just He was a little, obviously, a little baby, and he had this little leg. And the doctor who um, brought him into the world said to his parents, oh, it could be surgically removed. I'll come on to that in a minute. This leg was a developmental mistake, obviously, an embryological mistake. Um, Looking at it now, one might think it was related to uh, the wrong expression of a homeobox gene or a Pax gene or something like that, but that seems not to be the case. Professor Diane Donai, who is a professor of medical genetics at Manchester, suspects it might have something to do with a malfunctioning gene similar to one, uh, a gene called disorganised in the mouse, but it's, it's not at all clear. But obviously something genetically, developmentally went wrong, and this poor boy had an extra limb and his parents when asked if they would like to have it removed said no it was a punishment from god from a sin uh, for family sin and um, jill was talking about this jill haddo earlier about w what is a family and uh, her phrase was harmful family secrets and that family secret, of course, is unknown to us. But the family felt that th this was a punishment and it should stay that way. And so Andrew, in inverted commas, was hidden away for most of his life. And he stayed hidden in this cottage in um, part of rural Scotland. 
And for a long time, he wore a sort of skirt. Oh, he, they pushed him around in a pram when he was young. He wore a skirt. He just didn't interact with the local population at all. Unfortunately, of course, as he got older, his parents died. His sister, who looked after him, and his brother died. And by the time Andrew was about 48, 49, his elder brother, who's looking up to him by then, um, had pernicious anemia. And Andrew realised himself that he was... Um, I know this because there's a paper that's described something. Andrew realised, obviously, that he was going to have to look after himself. So he did approach his doctor, who approached a surgeon called Ian Smilly. And they eventually took him to a hospital and removed the third leg. <clears throat> and Mr Smilly, the, the surgeon, wrote this up as a case study. In slightly the manner of someone might have written about the elephant man, uh, um, in a manner which was perhaps rather distasteful. I'll quote you a bit. Um, it's, it's very arrogant. We thought we gained his confidence during the unsavoury task of preparing his skin and suggested he celebrate his successful treatment with a shave and a haircut. The suggestion was received in silence and disregarded. He showed neither pleasure nor gratitude. The post-operative photograph was secured at a second attempt only after angry words and our accusation of ungracious behaviour. Um, through a very clever archivist and through complete serendipity and I haven't time to tell you the story the archivist and I actually discovered who he had been and where he had lived so I was able to piece together from all these amazing internet things like Google Maps and satellites there were parish archives going back you know, hundreds of years that wasn't so necessary in his case parish annals, all kinds of things I was able to figure out where he'd lived and what would have been happening. And bizarrely, when I was Googling his family name, I came across an, a website by an American who obviously is some relation and who had all kinds of documents, um, probably from, this, from Andrew Kerr's uncle's letters online, and they'd gone to America. So whether they'd been involved in, in the family sin, I don't know. But anyway, um, I was able to construct, therefore, a fictional story about him. And after I'd written these stories, we had a discussion at the Genomics Forum. We had an ethicist and some writers and an artist who had been involved, um, geneticist and some poets. We were discussing the background to this. And one of the key points that came out was the question of privacy and invasion and how much you should write the ethics, even in a fictional story. Because I have to admit that having um, found out so much about Andrew Kerr, I was really excited. You know, it's the sort of excitement of the chase, isn't it? And to actually start pinning down all this information. And then I thought, well, was I not just doing what the surgeon who wrote about him was doing? Was I any better than the man who'd written this paper about him? Was I writing his story in the hope it would show how clever I was at finding out about him? Um, could my curiosity about all the other human exhibits also be sh seen as a form of voyeurism, a sensation-seeking? And that's a very hard question to answer, and I still haven't answered it. And uh, why did I choose the exhibits I did choose? And so on. I will just very quickly show you the third leg, which is in the exhibit. And that is a poem part of a poem written by a Diana Hendry, who was one of several poets who went round the Surgeons Hall Museum and got inspired by the exhibits. This is, she is written about the, the man with three legs from the point of view of him, his mother, uh, the doctor, and here a museum visitor. In its glass box, the leg looks like a joint of meat. I can picture it in the oven. It would feed about ten. The exhibit is entitled Supplementary Appendage Leg. So that just shows you yet another way of looking at Andrew Kerr's story. <coughs> so there was, again, then, this question of trust, how much to use, um, why am I, as a writer, using it? What do I want my readers uh, to find out? What do I want them to feel? And also part of my genomics forum work was then getting together with uh, present-day donors of brain, body, eyes, and um, 
collectors or organ retrievers, as they're called, um, somebody who retrieved corneas and eyes and somebody who retrieved um, femoral joints for bone grafts, and also talking to them about why they did it and finding out about their lives. And, of course, for a writer, this is absolutely fascinating. Um, you've the all kinds of comments, the hints of deeper reasons. Um, again, it's a question of trust, how much to reveal. And, of course, I did all... The modern-day writing was done with complete consent, and they were allowed to read their stories and say, don't put that in or do put this in. And, of course... You know, I long to show everything I found out, to reveal the characters, if you like, in all their humanity. Uh, it's terribly tempting to think about insights into their family and marital relationships, if they tell me, things like that. All these sort of things that novelists work so hard to extract from their fictional characters. There they are being presented. And, of course, all these things that journalists are so desperate to find out, too. It's, again, the excitement of the hunt. And... It comes down to human stories. <clears throat> and is, it, is this any different, actually, from media intrusion? Is this what seduce, seduces journalists to venture too far and report what they have found? Does our ethical reporting... <clears throat> excuse me. Do our views on ethical reporting spring, then, from an, an inherent sense of morality within us do they spring from a desire not to betray trust? Or do, are they just because an ethics committee has told us the rules? And so it's something we could each search our own um, ideas about too, perhaps. Scientists and writers, then. I'm just about near the end now. Scientists and writers, I think, we do share some things in common. We'll be talking about scientists and artists this afternoon. Scientists and writers, I think, observe. They... They, they both observe, they question, and they analyse. And I think in these aspects, both groups are very similar. Scientists, of course, we talk about scientific detachment. Um, from some of the talks I've heard, to, heard here to, today, too, I think sociologists employ a great deal of detachment, some extreme detachment, I would say. Um, perhaps for... A, Creative writer, detachment isn't possible. It's difficult to write about genetic difference without being deeply involved with the person or the fictional character. Most of you here have been trained, of course, to be objective, to transmit information. And for writers, I would argue that we have to find the balance between truth-telling, which can be very uncomfortable for the reader and for the writer as well, incidentally, in confronting our prejudices and engaging the reader's empathy through storytelling. And finally, as a final story, going back to the Surgeon's Hall Museum and about back to achondroplasia, I, Joyce Gunn Cairns is able to draw skeletons and imbue them with huge humanity. And here's her on the right, her drawing of an achondroplasic skeleton. James Jack on the left, is his portrait, his photograph, is also exhibited at the Surgeon's Hall Museum. And there's some pieces of blurb about him. He, as you can see, is an achondroplasic. And he was actually a, a technical assistant um, at the Surgeon's Hall Museum, employed throughout the war, and he retired in 1964. The blurb next to him says he was acquired as a technical assistant by Professor David Gregg. Now, Professor David Gregg had an enormous, long-living um, interest in skulls. And there is a huge collection of skulls in the Surgeon's Hall Museum, all boxed up, the Gregg collection. Gregg died in 1936. The thing I love, I couldn't find out very much at all about James Jack, even though apparently uh, Gregg made lots of photographs of James Jack's living skull. They, they don't seem to be in the archives anymore, which is very sad. Um, and I could find out very little about James Jack himself, apart from the fact he lived for quite a long time next to the Surgeon's Hall Museum and was on fire duty uh, during the war, and they put all the specimens in the basement, things like that. Um, and I don't even know when he died. He retired in, in 1964. But he obviously had a sense of humour, because when David Gregg died... 
James Jack is reported to have said, he didn't get me and he's dead. <laughs> Thank you. I'll leave it there. <laughs> Hello, thank you for your talk. I'm Sarah Von Tafelin from the VU uh, Medical Center in Amsterdam. And I came in early yesterday so that I could uh, spend a day at the museum. And um, I wasn't uh, expecting that my museum visit would connect uh, so directly with uh, what I've seen today. But at the Tate Modern, there's an exhibition by Damien Hurst. <laughs> And <laughs> your photographs of the um, surgical museum reminded me of that. Um, I was wondering if you, uh, if you also had connections when you were in there. You, you mentioned when you were in there that you felt uncomfortable and that kind of thing. Um, were there any other connections that you had to other pieces of art or other um, artist's work that you had when you, were, when, you, when you saw these things that were being... Um, uh, on display. The Surgeon's Hall Museum d has very little um, modern art. I mean, it is just an anatomy and pathology collection. It has the artwork by Joyce Gunkens. It does have some very interesting artwork by uh, Charles Bell, who's one of the surgeon anatomists, who Wait, do I mean Charles Bell? Steve Sturdy probably put me right on this. Uh, his paintings of gunshot wounds in... Steve, help me out here. Or is it, is Steve, <laughs> was it the crime? Uh, is it signs? Yes, it's signs, isn't it? One of the surgeon, thank you. The artwork of gunshot wounds, which is quite interesting. Um, I don't think there's much other in the way of paintings that really affected me. But there are what you might call, I suppose, sculptures in the, the uh, plaster face masks of people in the 1800s with facial tumours, and there's even before and after. And you can, and if you think about how these were made, you know, the plaster was actually put onto the faces with string. A very, very uncomfortable process while it hot, of course, as it was drying, and then taken off. And some of these people had open wounds. But, but then there were the, the face masks afterwards. And, I mean, as sculptures, they were horrifying, but very interesting also. And uh, they got me interested in thinking about the, the plaster casters, the men that actually did this, because they were also artists. You know, they, they then had to choose the skin tones and paint them and so on. I'm sorry, it probably doesn't really answer your question, but uh, I, I found them very affecting, certainly. I think it's very interesting how you, how you see the, the, the objects, the artifacts, which were medical artifacts as uh, pieces of art when you're thinking about then the, how, the, how it, they were painted. Mm. So it does, uh, it does sort of uh, uh, answer that question. Thank you. I was interested in your comments that um, empathy may conflict with truth-telling. Um, in my practice as a writer, I would see empathy as a way to get at the truth. It's, you have empathy towards a character, whether they're fictional or real, and that, that gives you the, the sort of drive, the narrative drive to explore what that character <laughs> is like and to want to tell their tale. So that the, the, the two things are not necessarily in conflict. They can be, they can be wrote 
together. Mm. And surely you want to tell the sort of inner truth of that character through getting the reader to empathise with them. Did I actually say empathy and truth-telling were... Mm. Maybe in conflict. Uh, sorry, mm. that's what I heard. Yes. So what do you think? <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree with you, actually. <laughs> uh, I think in order to empathise, you do have to tell some of the truth, yes. There, there's no question of that. You can't understand a character if you don't tell some of the truth about them. But I, th I think what rises me is always where you draw the line in terms of what you as a writer, the, the line you want to step over, or what you want your readers to, to think about. And there is this tremendous, I find, tremendous pressure to tell all as a writer. And yet I'm having to sort of pull back and say, no, don't, don't tell all. Leave things to the imagination. And um, just hint, <laughs> rather than being too specific, I think. You were talking about the, um, the kind of the, the detachment or neutrality of... Uh, Sociologists, and you said something about uh, some of us you know, were, were very, and uh, I couldn't help hearing that as a kind of uh, criticism in some way. Uh, uh, was it? Had you been shocked by how? <laughs> we can uh, take it. <laughs> <laughs> Will I still get dinner? <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, first course only. <laughs> no, I. I it's, it's just it's my prejudice it's showing here. I'm having to con confront my prejudices today. Um, having been an experimental scientist, I suppose, uh, and a very much a hands-on person, I, I find it hard to get into the frame of mind where you, you think about and categorise certain conditions so that you eventually categorise and recategorise. And um, it seems to me producing a lot of... Um, thought about how you might do things but not actually doing it but you see that's just my prejudices because I'd just be in there <laughs> barging and doing it <laughs> so pay no attention to me <laughs> I'll go back home to my lambing shortly so I think um, the clock tells me that we should be uh, finishing around now, uh, and I have to remember an instruction from Christina. Uh, so I better do my instruction while I remember it, and then I'll return mm. to her. So the, um, your theme, those of you who are signed up to the dinner, and only those, other people may uh, cover their ears, uh, those of you who are signed up for the dinner, it says 7.30, as though it's like 7.34 or whatever. So 7.30 is drinks, and the dinner actually starts at 8. But don't take the 7.30 very casually, because they will start punctually at 8. Uh, so we should aim to get there 7.30, 7.40-ish, so we can have a nice drink and a chat and still uh, have the dinner uh, when the souffle is warm or whatever. Uh, okay, now, I, sorry. I, I That's just, good. I was afraid... That's really afraid. important. We need to know about no, the drink. I, yes. I've done this so many times when I've, I've been told one important thing and I've managed to forget it. So um, I forget my rudeness. Not so I all. wanted to say uh, thank you very much for, for sharing the, the research and the, the stories with us. I found that actually, uh, although I knew what you were doing, uh, seeing it put together like that was uh, very stimulating and interesting. And I think just that... Uh, I mean, the things you've highlighted about, you know, what's it like to know too much and to where do you draw that line around the, your responsibility to the person and, you know, there aren't ethics guidelines for that, mm -hmm. but it's a deeply ethical undertaking. Uh, so mm -hmm. I've enjoyed this very much. Thank you. And uh, thank you for sharing it with us. Thank you very much. <laughs>